Los Angeles, March the 4th, 1982. It's midday and John Belushi glides down Sunset Boulevard on his way to a power meeting. It will be his last. This is the beginning of his final 24 hours alive. Belushi has been using cocaine since he arrived in LA four days ago. His meeting is with the two men who, more than anyone, have been responsible for making him a star. Michael Eisner, the president of Paramount Pictures, and Belushi's manager, Bernie Brillstein. The purpose of the meeting was to decide what movie John was going to do for his commitment to Paramount. It was like George Clooney. They were coming to talk George or John into this movie. At the meeting, there's just one item on the agenda, uh, Belushi's next movie. Eisner wants him to star in The Joy of Sex, a farcical takeoff on a popular sex manual. He's convinced it'll be a surefire moneymaker. They saw him as a, as a star that could put people in the seats, and there was a project that was hanging around the studio that wanted to get made. They had an option on it. They'd paid money to get it written, and they saw John as the expressway to... Uh, to, uh, to get it done. Belushi resists. His instincts tell him that the joy of sex will be a career-damaging disaster and a personal embarrassment. I don't need nothing. He was saying, you have to read it, you're not going to believe it. And, you know, they, and so they want me to wear a diaper in this movie. That's how it's going to open, like I'm a baby in a diaper. During the meeting, Belushi receives a call from his friend and fellow actor, Dan Aykroyd. Aykroyd gives him some advice. Oh, don't do that piece of shit. Are you kidding me? Come on. Get away, get away. Get out, get away. Come home. It's the spring. Things will happen over the summer or the fall. We'll figure something out. I was writing Ghostbusters right then, which he would have been in. And I said, don't worry, John. We're going to cover it. We're going to do great stuff, you know? Don't be pressured to do this. Come home. Yeah, bye. Bye. Belushi flatly refuses to do the movie. It was very nice. No one yelling. It was no crazy thing. And it was finally decided that it was a st stalemate. You know, no one was going to do anything. But Belushi has a hidden agenda. He's battling an addiction that's getting the better of him. All right, I'll get it for you. How much did that cost me? 1800 bucks. John Belushi, God bless him, is an addict A to Z. And uh, just like every other addict, it's a deadly disease, and there's always reasons that people use, but fundamentally, it's the addiction that kills them. Just three years earlier, Belushi had the number one movie, the top-rated TV show, and the number one album, all at the same time. No other entertainer had ever done that. Well, that's one of those career highlights uh, that one gets once uh, in, in a career. Uh, John had Soul Man at the top of the record charts. He had Saturday Night Live at the top of late night television. And he had uh, the number one comedy in the nation. And we all shared the abundance. And it was a time of celebration and, you know, massive adrenaline rushes and uh, just uh, really good times. It was a heck of a ride. It was a good ride, <laughs> most of the time, for a couple of times, just hanging on. But you know, it was scary sometimes. It was exciting. It was fun. It was um, innovative. <laughs> it was different. Life with John was very fast. It was. It was. It was. Uh, it always um, was fast. He always was on a fast track. He uh, had um, a lot to do. <laughs> he was very busy. <laughs> John, it was a person who seemed on a mission in general in life. Um, like a little tornado, he just went through life and, and brought people along. And uh, I think uh, <laughs> that most people enjoyed their time, but uh, he did have more energy than most people. Belushi was a comic genius. He was unpredictable, outrageous, a master of slapstick. Like Keaton or Chaplin, any of those people, and I would definitely compare him to those people. 
as a comedian. Um, he had a, a great ability to physicalize. So he could make you laugh by raising his eyebrow. He wanted to do more, to branch out into more serious roles, but the studios only wanted the Belushi they knew from his earlier movies. They'd love to have uh, me do uh, Animal House Goes to Camp, Animal House Joins the Army, Animal House uh, Rides a Space Shuttle, you know, but uh, it's not the way I work. You know? <laughs> the trouble is, Belushi hasn't had a hit movie in three years, and the pressure is beginning to take its toll. John Belushi has turned down the sex comedy the studio have lined up for him. Next, he changes the agenda. He's borrowed money from his manager before and now tells him he wants cash to buy a guitar. Come on, Bernie. And we had cash in the office, and I gave him $1,800 cash. It was me. Uh, God knows I didn't know what was going to happen. But the money is not for a guitar. be at the meeting that he allegedly came here for and to ask for money for drugs in the middle of the meeting. That's good drug addict behavior. That's how they behave. What's going through his head is, where am I going to get my next hit? What's going to, where can I get drugs? With $1,800 in his pocket, Belushi's drug binge is about to hit a new and dangerous level. Belushi's cocaine addiction began seven years earlier on the set of Saturday Night Live. Night. America was ripe for a new generation of, of humor, uh, and we just we, we just hit it at the right time. Of course, we were absolute rebels, uh, you know, uh, and really ill-behaved and uh, really bratty and ratty. Why about. me, man? I mean, why me? I think there was just an attitude of rebellion and irreverence, and uh, don't don't trust the old order. Um, which was part of why the show could succeed. In the late 70s, there was also a new attitude to drugs. Cocaine was easy to source, and the television industry was fueled by it. Monday, we come up with an idea. Tuesday, we wrote it. Wednesday, we read it. Thursday, we blocked it. And Saturday, it was on the air. It was, for a writer, uh, it was great. We got to produce our own pieces. We were given a lot of autonomy. So from that point of view, it was wonderful. But it was. Video commando time. Uh, we were live. There was a lot of pressure and stress. Uh, I relieved it by punching out the ceiling in my uh, dressing room so I had a little more air. People thought that was a temper tantrum. That wasn't. Uh, it was merely me physically trying to get a little more space in there because I was feeling claustrophobic. Uh, uh, we, we, you know, we let off steam on the weekends after the show. To be there and work there was to be like in a subway station for the rich and famous to be uh, at a party where, you know, there'd be Keith Richards and William Burroughs and Barishnikov and uh, Andy Warhol, you know, plus the cast, plus people from Hollywood, you know, all in the same place. And so that's, that's, un, that's sort of unduplicatable. But it, it, it's also a great lesson because after that, you know, there's hardly a party that is going to really impress me now. <laughs> the cast once had to do four shows in a row without a break. By the last week, almost everyone was using cocaine to keep going. It's 3 in the morning, and you have to think of three more jokes before 5 AM, and you're falling asleep, and someone puts out a line of cocaine. You have to be extremely strong-willed not to do it, simply because you need to stay awake. <laughs> Not because you're going to be funnier. <laughs> For Belushi and many on the show, Coke was seen as just a harmless stimulant, virtually risk free. Business. Uh, <laughs> okay, thank you very much. You can go. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. The entire culture had found this new thing, cocaine. And it's easy. If I take a sniff, you'll get far. You're not putting a needle in your arm. It's very clean. It was perceived as a drug that would help creativity. It would assist in loquaciousness and uh, 
solving the world's problems and exchanges. So it was just prevalent and ubiquitous. And uh, I think to John, it was a something that kept him up at night. It stimulated his, uh, you know, his, his, his thinking. But Belushi seemed to be using more than anyone else. He started going on binges. I think with John in particular, his appetites were always big, and that's where, you know, part of his problem was. Uh, he always did a little more than anyone else. He always went a little longer than anyone else. John was a man of the night. <laughs> he loved being John Belushi. He loved to sing in clubs. And at the time, I believe people were doing a lot of drugs, and I don't think he separated himself from the drugs. But it wasn't big time drugs. It was just really, I can't, you can't go back and understand that time. It was a time of Studio 54. It was a time of great separation of young people and old people. And a lot of people were doing drugs who couldn't handle them, uh, including adults, you know, people, lawyers, everyone. So if you kept John out of trouble and kept him focusing on what he was doing and his career, which he really didn't care about that. Well, when you get hot so fast, you don't have time to care. You think, more, more. They'll keep giving me more. John had an insatiable appetite for, for everything, for, for life, for, for all of the tastes and pleasures and sensations, of, you know, from, you know, motorcycle speed to, uh, you know, to, uh, to a, a good, you know, to three pieces of cherry pie. And he seemed like a bull. People thought he could do anything. And at that period of history, people didn't acknowledge the potential risk. There was a lot of sort of whatever sort of feeling about drugs and alcohol. They had no distinction between abuse and addiction. Addiction, you can't stop, even when you want desperately to stop. It's a biological process. It's different for different people. And once you cross that line or throw that switch, you're there. It's really a question of pharmacology and biology than any real psychological issue. The speed with which you get there sometimes has to do with what's going on emotionally with you because you're looking for solutions, trying to feel better, can't regulate, can't trust. But once you're there, you're there. Everyone thought it was the hippest thing in the world. And no one thought they'd die from it. No one. Without realizing it, over the three years he worked on the show, Belushi developed the addiction to cocaine that he would struggle with for the rest of his life. John Belushi has 22 hours left to live. Using the cash he borrowed from his manager, he's on a mission to score some drugs. He's barely slept in the past four days. He arrives at a friend's apartment. She has a valuable contact who's also there, Kathy Evelyn Smith, a dealer and junkie. How are you doing? Welcome to LA. How are you? Smith has spent years traveling with rock bands, supplying them with drugs. The three of them do coke. Belushi's wife, Judy, is at their home in New York. She knows he left for L.A. on a mission to get high and try to stop him. He was on a binge, and, you know, I wanted to, you know, knew if he went back, it wasn't going to end. He had a mindset and uh, just plowed right ahead, you know, made, made the choice. Belushi's friend, Dan Aykroyd, is also in New York at his office just a couple of blocks from Judy. The thing is, with John, he didn't even have to buy it. You know, people loved him so much, they wanted to hang out with him and socialize with him. So they would buy it for him and give it to him. Like, you know, he would show up at a party and they'd automatically hear, have fun. And uh, he would be collecting all this, this, this coke. And, uh, and it was, you know, Judy, Judy's job and my job sometimes to, to confiscate uh, without his knowledge and to get rid of it. With his wife and best friend on the other side of the country, Belushi is far away from those who care about him. He now takes some of the cash he got from Brillstein and gives it to Smith, sending her off to get more drugs. This time, it's not for cocaine. Belushi wants heroin. He's losing control, sliding deeper into his drug-fueled binge, and there's no one around to tell him to stop.
Just two years earlier, Belushi and Aykroyd were about to take the Blues Brothers on tour. They'd created the characters on Saturday Night Live and the movie had been a smash hit. But Belushi knew he had a problem and he wanted to deal with it for the tour. He hired a bodyguard, Smokey Wendell, to keep him away from cocaine. He said, you know, I have all this going on, the Animal House, the Saturday night, um, and I'm working on these other projects, and all of a sudden, uh, it's just going too fast for me. And if I don't somehow get a hold of myself and get control of myself, uh, I won't be around in the next two or three years. Smokey was great. He was uh, ex-New York State Police, ex-Louisiana State Police, and ex-Secret Service. He had gone with Nixon to China. He was a very colorful and wonderful character who had John's best interest at heart. I was asking him why he was so dependent on it. What, why did you always have to feel the need to go? Because most of the time, it's, it's usually basically loneliness, uh, pressure, um, more insecurities in yourself that you can't live up to that. And I, I believe when we talked about it, it, it was that. People always wanting him to be funny, people always wanting him to be on. There was no space. So that's why he would have to go to Candyland. On Belushi's last day, the drug that had once offered an escape was now controlling his every move. It's late afternoon and John Belushi has less than 19 hours left to live. After doing cocaine with Kathy Smith, he asks her to score heroin. Belushi then returns to his apartment at the Chateau Marmont in Hollywood. He makes a number of phone calls, first to Brillstein saying he's changed his mind. He will do the joy of sex after all. Next, a call to Michael Eisner, head of Paramount, telling him the same thing. Belushi now phones Eisner's senior vice president, Jeff Katzenberg, and arranges to meet on Friday. In a typically outrageous Belushi move, he tells the Paramount executive to give him a wake-up call. Katzenberg writes it in his calendar. Thanks. The executives believe Belushi is now on board. I have medical students every day in my unit, and I always train them to put their fingers in their ears when an addict is talking to them, because what they see is all bullshit, it's all obfuscation, it's all distortion, it's all their brain trying to find a way to get them out of there so they can continue using. So what you've got to respond in a, in a, with an addict is how they make you feel and learn to sort of intuitively read all that. And so this issue of John weighing out scripts and being so disturbed by that, there's no addict I know gets into that kind of nuance. It's more that he wanted to go use, he didn't want to do anything. True to form, the next call Belushi makes is to Kathy Smith to find out if she's scored the heroin. He wants to hook up immediately. Kathy, it's John. Yeah. How, how fast can you get here? His brain at that point will be going, use or die, use or die. The brain believes if it doesn't continue using, and believe is not really an accurate word, it, it, it manifests through neurobiological mechanisms that if the individual doesn't continue using, they will die. So use or die. Belushi shows no signs of slowing down. He and Kathy Smith spend the next four hours constantly on the move. Buying and consuming drugs, the pace frenetic and surreal. At one point, Belushi calls Dan Aykroyd in New York. He left me a message, a slurred, drunken, uh, kind of message that was just indecipherable. Uh, and I heard that on the answering machine, and then I just continued working. But Belushi's message worries Aykroyd. He'd been on the receiving end of these calls before. He walks from his office to Judy Belushi's Greenwich Village apartment. He and Judy have to take action. Uh, we, yeah, it was clear we, you know, had to stop, help stop him, try to get him some other kind of help. Um, I think Danny felt very immediately worried. He may have been more in touch with the reality of it from having heard that tape. 
they decide they have to rescue John and get him out of Los Angeles. Judy calls Smokey at his home in Virginia. She said, do you think you can find some time for John? And I had always told her, you know, never thinking it would happen. I would said, hey, if you ever need time, I will make time. Whatever I'm doing, I would do. And I, was, I said, OK, fine, I'll be out there tomorrow. Smokey tells Judy he'll fly to LA and bring Belushi home. But tragically, he didn't get to make that journey for her. Judy and John were childhood sweethearts. They met at high school. She was 15, he was 17. The first time I saw John, he was on stage. He was doing the varsity show, the big event in town. <laughs> I'd seen a lot of these shows, and he was one of the best, and I knew it immediately. This guy has talent. They grew up in Wheaton, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago. John came from a family of hard-working Albanian immigrants. His parents weren't really happy together, and I, and I feel that he knew that, sensed it, and I think that, you know, kids are unhappy if their parents are unhappy. And uh, I think a little bit of his humor around the house when he was young had to do with learning early that he could make his mother laugh, that, that she was a good audience, and um, maybe a little bit feeling like by making her laugh, he was making her happier. But I, I think also as he grew up, he realized well, I know, he said to me he could never make his mother happy. And I think, you know, that's one of those things that kids really suffer from. Dan Payne was Belushi's high school drama teacher. He remembers the first time he saw Belushi. It was at an audition. The music director said, well, John, what are you going to do? He said, and he just started, so, well, I was going to tell some stories. And he started telling things, you know, the, he was like a stand-up. And they were really funny. And all you could hear the other students waiting to audition, standing backstage, they were all laughing. So this guy said to me, this guy's hilarious. The kids just love him. We're going to put him in the show. He fit in everywhere, and I don't quite know why. He was short. He was stubby. I never, you know, you've seen the pictures of him. I don't think you'd say he was, uh, he was a nice-looking kid, a good-looking guy, but he was not, quote, handsome. Uh, he wasn't the big, blonde, idle kind of guy. He was just sort of there, you know? And, and, but people, he would just, there was something about, he was a very magnetic personality. By the time John finished high school, he was the football captain, the homecoming king, and voted most popular student. He liked to surround himself with people and always stood out in the crowd. I would say that John needed uh, the group. Uh, he was, he was a tough guy. I mean, alpha male, Illinois, heterosexual, toughy, but with, you know, an open heart. I mean, he was very sensitive and vulnerable, and this is partly the reason that he came to the demise that he did, that he trusted people. Tragically, on his last day, Belushi now put his life in the hands of a known junkie. It was to be a fatal error. <laughs> Belushi has less than 14 hours left to live. He and Kathy Smith arrive at the Roxy nightclub, a Hollywood landmark that leads to an exclusive upstairs bar on the rocks. Celebrities can do what they want here without being bothered. Slipping through a side door into the bar, Belushi is agitated, his mind racing. He's complaining to anyone who'll listen about the pressure he's under to do the joy of sex and the pressure of being John Belushi. Belushi and Smith go to the bathroom. A potent cocktail is being prepared, a mixture of cocaine and heroin that produces an immediate euphoric rush. It's called a speedball. Belushi has just upped the ante. He's about to inject cocaine, and he's added a powerful opiate to the mix. Heroin. It 
It's an extremely powerful delivery of large doses of the drug to, right to the brain. And what you see in humans when they're delivering the cocaine by this mechanism, uh, they begin behaving like laboratory animals. Laboratory animals, when you give them free access to cocaine, will use straight for a couple weeks and die. That's just about what humans do. They will either run out of money or they will die. And uh, a binge on cocaine, as I've said, is where you've, you've, the first hit feels great, the next, however many, each one feels subsequently worse until you develop a psychosis. It always develops. You know you're going there, and yet you can't stop from starting it. And once you start, you can't stop till you're done, till you run out of money or something horrible happens to you. Belushi and Smith spend five hours at On the Rocks, making more than one trip to the bathroom. Belushi seems unable to stop. By the way, if John Belushi stayed in Wheaton, Illinois, where he was born, he would have been the same guy. Same way. You can't blame someone for someone's drug problem. It's the person who thinks he can handle it, then all of a sudden he can't. And when you're doing drugs, all you want are drugs. You don't want a career. John was really good at creating characters, uh, but he hadn't gone through the maturity, which uh, there's no age for it. But I think maybe it was a little, uh, it was late. He was 33 when he died. He hadn't gotten to the point where he let go of the child, and didn't let other people define him, and, and decided for himself that he was uh, who he was, a good person worthy of everything good that came to him and those kind of ideas that I think give you your strength. And uh, he didn't have that. On his last day, Belushi is a shadow of his former self. His body is slowly being destroyed by the drugs he's consuming. It was all very different when Belushi was in his 20s. After college, he moved to Chicago with Judy. It was here he got his start at the training ground for America's top comedians, the famous Second City Theater. He knew that night, he said that night, this is what I want to do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get up here one day. In 1971, he did. He went straight to the main stage without having to train with one of the touring companies. That had never happened before, nor has it been repeated since. Oh, he was incredible. He walked on stage, he didn't have to open his mouth. One knew that he had enormous presence, and then he turned out to be a good actor. Belushi was a high-octane performer. He pushed at the boundaries for the rest of the cast. Of course, it was the perfect scene for John because he was given permission to be insane, you know. And John was one of, like, our bellwether. He, was, he sort of rode point for us as, the, as our little comedy wagon train went out into the wilderness. If John went, wherever John went, you know, anything south of John was sane. An actor has a very ambiguous position vis-a-vis -vis an audience. He has to expose himself to them, so to speak, and he has to ask them for his conf confirmation. And there's something in him that needs to ask and something in, in him which hates that need to ask. There was no sign of the addiction problems to come that were to destroy Belushi. When he was a Second City, uh, I think he was still young enough and buoyant enough that he didn't need a lot of pharmaceuticals to amuse him. He was so just thrilled to be on stage. I don't think he was more um, pharmaceutically inclined than the culture around him. He had an enormous amount of self-assurance and confidence, way beyond either his age or his, or his level of achievement. He, had, he just knew he would make it, and you knew he would make it. Chicago was, I think, a big formative time for John. He was on top of the world there. It was the safest place to be. He was successful. He was supported by his, his teammates. People would come in from out of town to look at him and say, you're doing a great job, come out and screen test for us. They could always return home to Chicago. He could count on the audience to embrace him. He knew what restaurants to go to. He knew where to get coffee at 2 in the morning if he wanted to take a walk. He had nice roommates. He had Judy, who was fabulous and supportive, and a rock. 
it was a, you know, he still had a dream. And so I think nothing could compare to those days. After Second City, Belushi got his break on Saturday Night Live. But everything changed when he won a part in the low-budget movie Animal House. He became an international superstar overnight. Opening night, I had never seen anything like it in New York. It was just, just crazy. The theater was crazy. So it was a big night. We were, it was a premiere, and it was in New York City, and he was like, you know, one of the stars of the movie, and it was, um, it was a moment of innocence, because he went forward uh, from that room, and I don't think it was ever the same. <laughs> you know, it just uh, took a turn. It wasn't all bad by any means. There was a lot of good that happened after that, but it was just sort of um, a, a real moment that changed after that. Well, you get to those heady atmospheres. Uh, it's. Uh... It, it, it's sometimes tough to stay anchored, and I think that that was certainly a factor in, in the usage of the cocaine and the vulnerability of John, the people who were preying upon him and kind of sucking his energy in that psychic vampire sense, you know. It had taken Belushi just seven years to make it. On his 30th birthday, he'd reached superstar status. He was number one in every medium, film, TV, and rock and roll. But in three short years, he would lose it all. It's close to midnight, and Belushi is still reeling from the combination of cocaine and heroin he's been injecting into his bloodstream. After five hours at the bar, Belushi and Smith leave. Belushi tells Smith to stop the car. He opens the door and throws up. Now they're heading back to the Chateau Marmont, Belushi's final destination. At bungalow number three, Belushi rushes to the bathroom and is sick again. <coughs> Belushi and Smith smoke a joint. He picks up his guitar, strums a few chords, and passes out. A few seconds later, he abruptly comes to. Three fifteen a.m. Kathy Smith injects Belushi with one more speedball. It will be his last. Earlier, at the height of his fame, Belushi came close to beating his addiction. Before taking the Blues Brothers on tour, he hired bodyguard Smokey Wendell. Smokey's brief was to keep Belushi away from drugs. He was put to the test on his first day. Belushi was in a recording studio learning a song for the tour. Wendell spotted an outsider talking to Belushi. These were people that would be commonly known as suppliers. They would uh, be able to produce uh, party favors. Smokey watched the dealer go into the bathroom after talking to Belushi. Smokey then went into the bathroom himself and found the drugs. John went into the bathroom, came back, said a few words to the guy, of which I knew it was basically whatever was there was no longer there. John went back in the booth, the guy went back in. So we did this three times. We played this game. Third time, John was getting really annoyed with the gentleman. Smokey then approached the dealer standing by the coffee table. And I said, you know, there are many ways to sweeten coffee. I happen to like sweet and low. Sweet and low looks very much like this. And I had poured it into the coffee. At that point, I said to the gentleman, I said, you know, we could do this all day. I just don't know how much money you can afford to lose. And the guy, like, got totally very uncomfortable. The dealer tried another tactic, slipping some cocaine into a cigarette pack. 
Belushi announced that he wanted a smoke and picked up the cigarettes. And he was going to put it in his pocket. Well, then I knew that there was a, a favor in there. That turned into a physical altercation with John and I. <laughs> it was a tug of war, and we were wrestling on the floor in the studio. And the two guys that were in the studio, they were, I don't believe this. I can't believe this. And we got up, and I said, John, look, if you want to do this, then you don't really need me here. If you don't, I mean, this is going to happen every day. It worked. We did a tour with the Blues Brothers, and that was grueling because we had, uh, you know, 20 shows in 16 cities. And, uh, you know, he, we, were, we were able to meter the, the, the dosages, and, uh, and John performed beautifully and effectively, and we had a great, lucid, clear, creative time. And uh, so uh, Smokey worked. Belushi kept clean for the entire tour. He desperately wanted to win his battle against addiction. And by the end of the tour, he was in such good shape, Smokey felt it was time to move on. And we had him working out and losing weight, and, and he would become, he said, oh, yeah, the highlight of my high tonight was I got two more push-ups in. But he would laugh, and, and that would be his way of saying, hey, I can do this. He would find time to come and talk to me. I would be asleep downstairs, and he would knock on the door. And it was basically, I think, he was at that point where he didn't want to sleep, he didn't want to go out, and he just wanted to talk. And it would be either about the work or the job, plans, ideas he has, his wife, how much he loved Judy, how much she meant to him. And I mean, on more than one occasion, he would say to me, you know, whatever she needs, whatever she wants, uh, don't ever question, you just do it. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. I said, well, then you can't question why we're sitting here together, because this is what she wants. And he just smiled, and he said, boy, you got me again. And that's when I knew, that as we kept bonding, that he wanted this, and then he was, it was becoming easier and easier for him. And I, at that point, I was, uh, I was looking to move on to the next, and I just said, uh, you know, I think, I think you're okay to go on. And I remember him being so disappointed. And I remember him saying to me, what is it? Do you want a car? Do you want to... I'll pay you more. I'll pay you... I said, it's not that. You don't... John, you don't need me. The following summer was one of Belushi's happiest spent at his favorite place, Martha's Vineyard. It would be his last. You know, it was beers and wines and occasional, occasionally a little of the green stuff, uh, but... Uh... No, uh, no powders or pills that summer, and it's certainly reflected in the picture where he's standing with Judy belly to belly. He's got a blue shirt on and a hat, and you can see how good his color is. He's got the full weight on. There's no gauntness there. And it was a summer of, of, of body surfing, jeep rides, running on the beach, uh, dodging sharks. That was truly it. He was truly off and relaxed then. Those were wonderful moments. He did have more energy than most people, and that was, that was his, uh, you know, need to slow down sometimes was a, something he, he had trouble doing. But once he got slow, he was real slow. <laughs> Put him on a beach and he could stay there all day. Just keep bringing some food, water, he'd be fine. At the end of the summer, Hollywood came calling again. Belushi agreed to star in the comedy Neighbors with Dan Aykroyd. Well, Neighbors, we shot at night on Staten Island, and again, at that time, uh, Coke was ubiquitous, and everybody was using it like coffee. It was, uh, it was to keep us up at night, you know. But for Belushi, it meant temptation. He tried what we call white knuckle it. He tried to just avoid all this. You can only do that so long. It's like trying not to eat. You can only go so long without eating. Eventually, you're going to eat. He stopped uh, lots of times. <laughs> Yeah. He had a fairly long, success, seemingly successful time. But, I, I, you know, in retrospect, uh, clearly whatever that was wasn't dealt with. He was just in abstinence. It's like the dry drunk, you know. Um, if you stop drinking but you haven't, it's the same thing. Whatever that is, whatever that's about. Getting people off drugs is the easiest thing in the world. Anybody can get off drugs. The problem is staying off. And that's where the whole treatment process comes in. Now, many people believe, A, they can control themselves, and you see this is not a volitional process, so they can't, 
or that B, they could substitute it with something else like exercise and yoga and all these things. And that will work for a time. But inevitably, when there's a stress, when there's uh, drugs available, <laughs> they will relapse. He could be triggered because he didn't feel, he had a, sh a scene on the show he really wanted to be on, and it wouldn't be on, and that could trigger it. He could uh, have had um, some great success. It was so exciting that it triggered it. <laughs> so I just think um, drug addiction, ultimately, there is some kind of chemical imbalance or dysfunction going on, and I think, um, there seems to be new research all the time, and maybe one day someone can tell us all about this, but I really don't know. <laughs> I just don't know. Intervention back then was not a tool that was used. Today, uh, if we had a problem like this, we'd get six to ten people together. We'd get the guy or girl in the room and sit them down and say, it's going to stop, you're going into rehab, that's it, and the, the flex cuffs would come out. Now, I mean, now that's what we do. Back then, that was not... Uh, a, a, you know, a, not, not a technique that was, uh, that was widespread. After filming Neighbours, Belushi's cocaine addiction took hold again. With each hit, he was slowly killing himself. And on his final day, he was far from those who could have saved him. It's just before dawn. John Belushi has six hours left to live. He's been injecting cocaine and heroin all day. He complains of feeling cold. Kathy Smith puts him to bed and turns up the heat. Belushi lapses into sleep or unconsciousness. He's dying of his disease at this point. This is not an overdose. This is toxic, chronic, toxic effects on the body, overwhelming him finally. Smith writes a letter and orders toast and coffee from room service. At 10.15 a.m., she makes one last check on Belushi. He's snoring. She puts her drug paraphernalia, a syringe and spoon, into her purse and leaves. Belushi is now alone in the bungalow. His wife, Judy, and best friend, Ackroyd, are at home in New York. Sure, I, I mean, I felt like I should have been with him that whole time out there. It would have been different if I was there. But you come back to a point where you realize, well, first of all, it might not have been different if I was there. And um, it just, it's just a life, you know, life. You, it's just, you got to let go of it. You got to know that's what it, I get, that's what happened. That's all that you can, there's no more. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Can't redo, so or I was gonna go out there that night. You know? It was just that close, you know. It was really close, like a hair close, you know. Yeah, to, uh, you know, of course, I, I will always feel for the rest of my life that maybe I didn't do enough, and, uh, but, uh, but he was uh, alienating us at the end as well, you know, and pushing us away, and uh, he'd get real mad if you, if you took the coke away, and, uh, you know, and. Uh, you know, it was, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll live with that for the rest of my life. That we did, that we didn't get there in time. Belushi has been lying unconscious in his hotel bed for hours. Then at 12 p.m., Bill Wallace, Belushi's assistant, arrives at the bungalow with a typewriter Belushi wanted for script writing. John. Wallace immediately senses something is wrong. He can't hear John's John. usual snoring. John, come on. We're gonna be late. He walks into the bedroom, telling Belushi it's time to get up. Belushi is curled up on his right side. Wallace shakes him. There's no response. He discovers Belushi is not breathing. His first instinct is to call Brillstein. We're in trouble. First words, we're in trouble. What do you mean, in trouble? He's sleeping, won't get up. 
no, no, he's having a problem breathing. And I said, oh. And I went into action like I knew what I was doing. I had my assistant call 911. Uh, John, come on, wake up. Come on, John, wake Wallace up. Wallace pounds on Belushi's chest, wake tears up. in his eyes, wake crying, up. you dumb son of a bitch. Wake up! Come on, John. I went to the uh, Cedar Sinai to wait at the emergency uh, entrance so no one would know John was coming over. At the Chateau Marmont, paramedics place Belushi on the floor. Not knowing he's already dead, they suspect a heart attack. They try to revive him, but soon give up. Is that all you're gonna do? Wallace protests, but they say it's too late. John Belushi died on the morning of the 5th of March, 1982. At the Cedar sinai Hospital, Brillstein waits and waits. The ambulance is not coming. And finally, one of my assistants called and said, uh, Bernie, you can come home. John is dead. And what do you do when you're alone in a phone booth? No one had a cell phone then. And one of your best friends died. You can't believe it. I, of course, felt responsible. You know? I know everyone says this wasn't your fault. He would have gotten the money someplace else. But I gave him the 1800 bucks. You know, uh, do I wish I hadn't? Sure. It was his money. You know, he had made it for me, I gave it to him. And I guess the guitar is still there. <laughs> the police arrive at the Chateau Marmont, then the media. The word will soon be out. The first thought I had was, Judy's gonna hear it on the radio. I called Danny in his 25th Street office Got him on the phone and said, Danny, don't ask me what to do. I'm telling you, John is dead. It's not a joke. I was writing Ghostbusters at the time, and uh, I was writing a line for him when the, when the call came from Mr. Brillstein that, uh, that, he'd, uh, that he'd gone. And uh, I immediately got up and went outside to get to Judy. I didn't want to take a cab. I didn't want to be carried. I had to move myself. Otherwise, I would have just buckled to my knees, and I ran ran down to Judy's uh, from 5th and 23rd, I ran down to Morton Street. I heard someone punching the lock and, uh, and run up the stairs, and it was Danny. And, uh, and I, I told her before anyone else knew, you know, that he was, that he was gone. And, uh, but it was essential for me to get there before, the, before she heard it from someone else, so. And, you know, that's a real good friend. It was two weeks later that coroner Thomas Noguchi confirmed the cause of death. The officer issued the official uh, death certificate described as acute cocaine and heroin intoxication. An examination of Belushi's arms revealed that he'd been injecting for some time. He had injection sites both sides. I mean, no, this is not an overdose. This is this is toxic effect of intravenous drugs. It's hard for me to believe that he was doing intravenous drugs for only four or five days. This does not look like that kind of situation at all. This is like somebody's been doing it for a while and finally dies of it. Kathy Smith was arrested and eventually served 18 months in prison for her part in the tragedy. She was convicted of involuntary manslaughter. Every year, thousands of fans still make the pilgrimage to Martha's Vineyard just to stand at Belushi's grave. So somehow, he's just uh, touched people in that way. And I, I think um, when you actually have people feeling that you've made a difference in their life, then they don't forget you.
four years of television and seven movies, and we're still talking about him. Isn't that amazing? You get a sense that we do meet those who've gone before, and we meet them in the form that we knew them. And they meet us in the form that they knew us. And just for a while, not forever, not for eternity, there is a reunion there. And it's going to be one rock of night. Thank you.